guys, welcome back to the Stuff of Legend. My name is Dilo, and this is another episode of Bro Talk. Bro Talk. <laughs> I have a very special guest for you here today. I have the man, the myth, the legend, Daniel Gall, Danikin Skywalker, Darth Gall, and he is just amazing. My friend, we go way back, we work together. Uh, we go to church together. We go to different churches now, but we've served together at times, and it's just, it's such a blessing to have him here. But you guys are going to be blessed because this is going to be awesome. We're going to be talking about Star Wars Rebels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if you guys haven't followed, um, it's a show that's on Disney XD, and it is marketed kind of as a kid's show. Now, if you're a Star Wars fan, it is like a dream come true. The battles... Mm. The Force using, the lightsabers, the Inquisitors, Darksiders that are not necessarily Sith. There's a lot of in there. Um, we are going to break into some spoilers here in a bit. Yeah, shh, lots of spoilers if you haven't seen Star Wars Rebels. If you plan to see it, you may not want to watch this video just yet. Go check out Star Wars Rebels and then come right back over here. Daniel also has a channel. It is Daniel Gall on YouTube. And he does vocal impressions. Insane vocal impressions. I am super jealous of this guy's natural gift and his skill to hear and and pick apart the details of every little voice and be able to replicate that i do that myself but this guy is a wizard he's the man and uh we're gonna probably do some of that today yeah mm. be not jealous brothers we are yes <laughs> use the force luke <laughs> join the dark side <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll get more on that later. Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. And good to be, always awesome to be talking about Star Wars. Always so, awesome. Mm -hmm. How long have you been a Star Wars fan? And what was your first experience? Ooh, I'd say I've been a Star Wars fan. Let's see, I was born in 86, so I've been a Star Wars fan pretty much since I was five or six. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going on 25, 26 years now. 26 years. And my first Star Wars experience, I'd say, it was visiting friends in Sacramento, walking in, like, like watch, going to the back room with friends and watching Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what's funny? That was my first Star Wars experience, too, was watching Return of the Jedi at a friend's house. Well, of course. It was, for both of us, it was the first movie that was closest to our birth year, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. 83. Yeah. I'm 92. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was 86, so it's close you, for each of us. You've been a Star Wars fan longer than I've been alive. Oh, wow. 20, I'm, I'm 25, you've been 25, 26 years a fan? Mm-hmm. It's pretty close. Yeah, We're not pretty, too far. Pretty apart. close. Not mm -hmm. too far. What is it about Star Wars that keeps you coming back for more? Like, why Why do you love Star Wars? Well, part of it, of course, was the action. It's the only movie you see lightsabers in, of course. Yeah. And, of course, <laughs> the other part is going as a going up there loving, as a his student of history and becoming a history teacher. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed very much seeing the deeper levels of the stories, getting to know the characters, seeing how they're... How their choices, their their action, their lifetimes play into each other, mm -hmm. and so that's part of what has made kept me going, coming back to the Star Wars, and mm -hmm. also the in some sense the look at the, the philosophical battles of it as well. Seeing how and actually I've used Star Wars in my teaching, looking at history, looking at different concepts, looking especially when we get to the to the World Wars, the Cold War, mm -hmm. this constant state of battle we've been in real life, and this the show parallels with Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Plus, being kind of a multi generational. Uh, franchise it helps to it helps to bring the generations together so to speak totally and I actually just had my friend Dusty on the show also a Star Wars fan he is a bit older but like you just mentioned it brings the generations together mm. it's a timeless thing because they've been able they've been, had success and been able to make new iterations of the stories prequels and sequel trilogies TV shows for kids that translate to everybody mm. <laughs> there's, there's so there's some episodes that really make me question why it's on a Disney channel. There's some darker stuff there, mm -hmm. but it's awesome. It's great, and it does bring everybody together. There's a lot of things in life that can do that, and mm -hmm. it's just really cool that Star Wars is one of those things. Oh, yeah. So what was your favorite Star Wars movie, and well, why? as they were coming out, like, I mean, if the 8 have come out and the ninth coming up, I'd say my favorite overall as a kid was definitely Return of the Jedi. It was my strongest memory of Star Wars, and mm -hmm. seeing how everything led up to that, like, it kind of brought everything together for the, for the classic trilogy. But my favorite overall of the 8 that have come out, without a doubt, my favorite would have to be Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Because mm -hmm. in a sense, looking at the looking at the classic from the prequel to the classic trilogy, the whole six movies is basically the life thought in the time of Anakin Skywalker, yeah. and that was the one missing chapter. And really, it was the really the crux of his life, where it brings everything is together, all his choices afterwards, and all of his choices before. Mm -hmm. You rely on that movie. Mm -hmm. It's it's so pivotal for the entire. I mean, that's the whole reason they did the tr the prequel trilogy was to tell the story of how Anakin turned to the dark side and then how he becomes Vader and how he becomes Vader. And it was you know it's so so such a deep story, so cool. 
Ewan McGregor's performance along with Hayden Christensen, a lot of people have mixed feelings about Hayden, but in episode three, there's no doubt that was one of the most emotional uh, movies for like sci-fi or, or anything like in that genre yeah. ever. It was so strong. I mean, just the, the feelings that you get watching that final scene where, you know, you, you were my brother, Anakin, you know, like that whole, you were the chosen one. You were supposed to destroy, destroy the Sith, not join them. Yeah. From my point of view, the Jedi are evil. <laughs> then you are lost! <laughs> <laughs> and that lightsaber battle, probably one of the best we've ever had, except maybe in The Last Jedi with Rey and Kylo in the throne room. In my opinion, that was a really good fight scene. A uh, really good lightsaber battle. She throws his lightsaber across the room. He grabs it, poosh, beams it through the guy's head. And, oh, yeah. You know, just like the whole Imperial Guard. Oh, they're not Imperial because it's, well, it's the First Order. Yeah, they're, they're dressed like they're really Imperial Guard, but they're yeah. a little different. Yeah, it's similar. Similar role, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still some debate about whether they were Force users or not, right? That is also true. Yeah, there's debate. Maybe the book will mm. uh, enlighten us about yeah, that. True. Maybe the book, like, I think the book might have details. I can't wait for that to come out. So I, can I think it is out now. Ah, uh, yes. It just came out, I believe. And so there's a lot of people online that are raving about Raylo, mm. Ray and Kylo, and oh. having a relationship together mm -hmm. because of the details that are laid out in the book that you don't get to read in the movie. Watching mm. the movie, it's easy to kind of skim past some of the minute details of like uh, micro expressions mm. in the face mm -hmm. uh, between Daisy Ridley and Adam Driver. Yeah, you know what that means. Next purchase, episode eight. That's right. I love that Revenge of the Sith is your mm. favorite. Honestly, Rogue One. I loved Rogue One, seeing Saw Gerrera, Galen Erso, you know, and, and the planning of the Death Star, it brought so much depth to the original trilogy. It shows the consequences that it took to even get there. It added so much depth, and it, I think in my mind, bolstered the strength of the Star Wars lore for me. Mm, yeah, that's one of the other biggest things, too, like looking at the the old canon before Disney, like seeing how the, that's mm -hmm. part of like how I appreciate it much more, because seeing the stories and the characters, the one of the things they agreed on for the... For legends was that they would going they would bring all their stories together, they tie the characters and timelines together and all everything would line up with George Lucas's timeline to make it mm -hmm. one one canon. I don't disrespect the new canon for being different because it's a movie franchise. Mm -hmm. It's kinda like how Marvel takes comic book movies and serious comic book storylines everybody loves, like Civil War. And they are not gonna tell it the same way that it was in the books. Mm -hmm. Because then you would know how the movie plays out. You know, like they want to give you something a little bit different. I know with Star Wars, it kind of almost hurts because we grew up on those books and it, yeah. it's like a punch to your nostalgia. <laughs> but it does help that Disney is pulling material from the old canon, from Di the Legends now, to yeah. help to help put their franchise out together. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I've got to give a big spoiler alert for Star Wars Rebels. So if you have not seen it and you intend to see it, or if you're not all the way caught up on Star Wars Rebels, it's up to you. You can you can stick around, you can enjoy the ride, but be warned, we're going to talk in heavy detail about the events of Star Wars Rebels up till... Family Reunion and Farewell. Yes. The so, end of Rebels. Exactly. So if you haven't seen those, you may want to hold off. <laughs> Go see those. Turn off the camera. <laughs> yeah, or turn your volume down. Because <laughs> yeah, it's going to get it's gonna get awesome. Rebels. It is a sequel series inside of the new Disney canon that follows the events of Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, the Clone Wars, Revenge of the Sith, and then it jumps in with Rebels. A few years after, right before Rogue One. Yeah, so you can it takes place about 15 years after Revenge of the Sith, so mm -hmm. it's about four or so years before A New Hope. And also, the characters from both the Clone Wars and from Rogue One show up in Rebels. If you haven't seen season three or four, spoiler alert, Saw Gerrera. I I'd seen uh, Rogue One, like many of you guys, the year prior. I was so excited, and like, uh, when, when he shows up, it adds so much more depth to who he is in Rogue One. This is like one of the reasons why Rogue One is one of my favorites. It's not just from the movie, but the appreciation you get for those films because of how the rest of the canon builds upon what you've seen in the movies to add layers to those characters, to add depth and purpose and reason. It's so cool. And I, both of us have seen The Clone Wars. Mm. And Saw Gerrera was in the Clone Wars. Yeah, he was there in the Battle for Onderon, if I remember correctly. Yes, and he, Anakin was there. In, um, and so Ahsoka. Ahsoka. Okay, so he, he, his sister Stila die in the last battle, mm -hmm. and that really had some death, or some uh, tragedy to his character. He's in, in, in Star Wars Rebels Season 3, right behind us, in fact. Yep. Yeah, he saw, still carries her holographic picture with him as a reminder of that loss. And, and so he shows up in the on Geonosis, no less, which is ironic because the Geonosian weapon killed his sister. Mm -hmm. And that's where we see a rogue Geonosian who escaped the, the, the Imperial destruction. In, in the legends, species like the Geonosians helped design 
the Death Star. In fact, in the Legends, actually, it's Moff Tarkin's old friend. His name is, ooh, just had his name in my head. He was actually responsible for designing the TIE Fighter and Darth Maul's ship. He was an ally of Darth Plagueis before his death. Wraith Sinar. Okay. Yeah, Wrath, Wrath Sinar. He was an old <laughs> friend of Tarkin's. He actually designed a planet, planetoid battle station. Basically, it was like three spheres. Basically, it was a brainchild of his he wanted to let go because he had big misgivings about so much concentrated power in one big place. Mm -hmm. Tarkin stole the idea, presented it to the Emperor as his own. The Emperor gives it to the Geonosians who uh, redesigned to amp up. Mm -hmm. And basically, from there, that's when, after the Geonosian design, we see in episode two. After that, we see the Empire start building it with help from the Geonosians and the Wookiees as slaves. Mm -hmm. And from there, the Geonosians are almost wiped out. So, in Star Wars Rebels season three, we see the Geonosian hope guiding, guarding the egg of the last Geonosian queen. And we see. He tries to tell them, like, it's a circle within a circle. They think he's talking about something in the local area, but he's actually describing the Death Star. I get so dang excited. Because <laughs> he's like, do you see these things? And in the show, obviously, they're like, what is this? They don't really explain it, but if you have followed, mm. you see these things, and you're just like, there's the Easter egg! Mm. I found you! And it's like, it's so cool, because Dave Filoni... He's the guy that put together Star Wars Rebels. I believe he doesn't have any live action, actual like on camera directing work, but he's done some animated and some written. Mm -hmm. And that guy is so good at telling Star Wars stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you haven't seen Rebels, <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> I gotta encourage you to watch Rebels. <laughs> yes, but there's a lot of tie into the movies too, because in, in, from season one, actually, all the way through season four, one of the kind of the things behind the scenes, or the one of the hints, Easter eggs, is that the Death Star is being constructed from season one, there, and in yeah. season and in season four, they become there are two giant kyber crystals that are basically going to be used as do some special part of the Death Star's super laser. They'll power yeah. it, and then actually that's what becomes Saw Gerrera's. Uh, obsession after finding the Gene Ocean, and then in season four, he finds out the crystal that's going to a secret Imperial project. And yeah, that episode, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, it was so such a cool, such a cool story. A lot of Sabine in that episode. Mm. I love when we get Sabine action, anything with Mandalorians, mm. like, gets me so hyped. Oh, yeah, I can't, I can't even handle it. That's one of the reasons why the Clone Wars is one of my favorite TV mm. shows of all time, the storylines between Darth Maul mm -hmm. and, you know, having a Savage Oppress and then also Pre Vizsla, mm -hmm. getting into the Darksaber, getting into the Mandalorians. And in mm -hmm. Clone Wars, they didn't really touch on the mm -hmm. Jedi versus the Mandalorian War, mm -hmm. but they have touched on that a little bit, just mentioning mm -hmm. in Rebels. So perhaps I'm on our next is I'll bring over, uh, like, the series called Knights of the Old Republic. It takes place before the, the game series. It's during yeah. the Mandalorian Wars. And I love Amalek. the games. Oh, but it's when Revan and Malak are still Jedi. Was, the main character is actually this, uh, kind of like, the people, the pictures of Anakin Skywalker, and then his polar opposite. Someone who has a lot of desire, but not much power. Yeah. Basically, his name is Zane Carrick. He actually becomes a pivotal force in the Mandalorian Wars, behind the scenes. Like, say. Mm -hmm. Not in the main battles, but in the helping the common people. And he actually... One of his key allies is a Mandalorian. During the Clone Wars, Demogol, he's basically, picture Jack the Ripper and Frankenstein rolled into one, put him in Mandalorian yeah. armor, that's Demogol. That sounds so legit. I wanted to get uh, the Sabine Wren mm -hmm. um, pop doll, because I collect the pops, but the, the Sabine Wren one on Amazon is going for like over 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, that, for the helmeted one. I, I, there's, they have her without the helmet, and it's cool. But I do really want the helmet one because it's got all of her art on there, and on the pop, it's the body's smaller, the head is bigger, and I kind of want to see that visual. Mm -hmm. So it's like you know, I want to be able to see it a little bit better. So that one's one that was on my list. But like having the Mandalorian team yeah, up, yeah, exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. That's it. Sounds so legendary. In the Clone Wars era of of the old canon, so there's a series of four or five books called the Omega Squad series. Basically, it's mm -hmm. like a basically it's like four books where it's like the Special Forces version, and the most of the, the main characters are mostly clones. And yeah, it's actually some and they're actually trained by the Mandalorians that Jenka recruited, and they actually have their own storyline mm -hmm. behind the scenes. And one of the things I love the it's actually in Mandal it's like it's in Hatties I think or in Mandalorian says Kenu Jukadir Shamandoade. Which means, translated, don't mess with Mandalorians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My man is speaking Mandalorian right here. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. In Star Wars Rebels, who is your favorite character and why? That's an interesting question. Are you calling hero or villain? Okay, fine. I'll give you both. Okay. So let's start with hero. Okay, for the fave hero, I'd have to say either Kanan or Ezra. One, because they're both Jedi, but looking at Ezra, since the whole story of Rebels is kind of told from his point of view, I mean, in seeing the trailer for season four, Hera points it out that was, the whole story was about a girl who was lost and a boy who was alone. Mm -hmm. So Ezra is one of the most pivotal characters of, 
of Rebels. It's really he's the one that everything seems to rotate around. He's kind of the glue that that holds them together. Even mm. when Kanan didn't want to join the team, he didn't want to fight in a war. He didn't want to be a soldier. Essentially, mm. even even though he kind of was trying to suppress and abandon his Jedi practices, trying to hide who he was. Ezra is the one that brought that out of him. He sees this kid. He's force sensitive. What is he going to do? Just leave him? Mm. He'd be found out and killed. He could be turned into a Sith. He knows what this could entail for them. Jedi are hunted. So yes, yes, in a sense, true. But you remember, a, he would not become a quote a Sith, so to speak, because Vader. Even though they train many Inquisitors, the Inquisitors are just dark Jedi. They are only two Sith. Like Palpatine, still he honors the rule is because they all, not because if it's any kind of ideology and thing, but just because it helps him keep control of his underlings, make sure they don't become too powerful. Right, and uh, I think yeah, for me, I think that was a bad choice of words. I should have said dark side. He, mm-hmm. he could fall to the dark side. Yeah, and he's, um, he is drawn to it in a sense. Oh, you see that in this season for sure. Or in the in the season... Uh, yeah, so between seasons two season and three, three. yes. Yeah, three is, and four. Yeah, he's drawn a bit more towards the dark side, but thankfully from there, from after seeing where Maul's path was leading and also seeing where the rebels where they really needed to go, Ezra made a very positive choice and really embraced the spirit of what it meant to be a Jedi. I love what they did there with like the holocrons and Maul had had kind of guided him in this very deceitful mm. way. Very, mm. You know, he's selfish. He's and he's trying to use him. He wants to have his own kind of a padawan, but it's mm. going to take him in a place he doesn't want to go. He knows that, mm. and Kanan is able to kind of get get to him in that way. You know, like support mm. him and figure out how to be what Ezra needs him to be. There's so many cool relationship moments there, especially with those two characters you mentioned mm. as. Possibly your favorite, Ezra and Kanan. Mm. I, I love those characters. Yeah, plus, are... plus the fact that Freddie Prince Jr. was Kanan, that made it. Right. I mean, having seen him both in, I've seen him in like the, both the Scooby Doo movies, and then finding out that his wife, Sarah Michelle Geller, plays one of the Inquisitors. Oh yeah. Yeah. She played <laughs> the she played the seventh sister. Oh wow. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. That's yeah. Every season they got the fate play. They were married, but they're fighting on screen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's great. Freddie Prince Jr. He's a good actor, but I underestimated him in this as Kanan. Mm. I didn't even know it was him for the. Like, I think it was like halfway through season two when I was like, I wonder who's playing who. Googled it real quick, and I found out Freddie Prince Jr. is Kanan. I didn't even recognize his voice. Like his his skill as a vocal mm. artist is really good. Yeah, you know, since like, that's talent. True, it was a different bit of a different venue for him, but I think he really embraced Kanan and the totally. whole Star Wars mythos. Yeah, for me and my wife, we already gave a spoiler alert. If you're trying to watch out for spoilers, we're past that already. Oh yeah. In the re- one of the recent episodes, the death of Kanan Jarrus. Mm. The death of Caleb Doom. Yeah, that was. I mean, that was a bit. That was very much a surprise. I mean, I knew it was that so were, emotional. Yeah, I mean, yeah, kind of like in a sense, we like with Hera talking past tense in the in the series the trailer. It wasn't like the, the, the season four. It was a bit of a forecast that somebody, or at several members of the team, were gonna die. But that yeah, Kanan would go first. That was wowzer. I thought they would have saved that for the end. I yeah. thought that he would he might die at the end of the series. Or maybe it was going to end up kind of like a Rogue One situation mm-hmm. where the reason we haven't heard about these guys is because they all gave their lives for something. And, you know, maybe that's just how, how it played out. But th- that was a huge surprise to jump back from the season, what was it, the season break jump back? Mm-hmm. They brought it back from the season break. That was the first episode back. Dave Filoni just reached in and ripped our hearts out. And my wife legit cried. Oh, legit no. cried. We were, watch- we were sitting on my bed right over there, watching on my TV right over there. And that happens, and my wife like grabs my arm, and she's like holding it like really, really tight. And I was like, I was like already kind of emotionally, I was on, not on the edge of my seat, I was laying down on my bed, but I was like, like what the heck? Like, no, no, he can't, he can't. And I told my wife, I was like, babe, he's talking to, he's talking to Ezra and Sabine like this. Is, these are his last words when he was going to rescue Hera. I was like, those are last words. He's talking like these are last words. Why are they doing this? They can't do this yet. No. And then they did. And, <gasps> and uh, I teared up. I oh, teared up a little bit. I wasn't like crying. My wife was hard yeah, crying, like, but I was like waterfall. Yeah. Oh, like she wow. was just. She was like, babe, I don't know if I can keep watching this. I'm like, and she's like, she's pregnant. Yeah. And she's mm-hmm. like, ex- you know, there's emotions yeah. going on here. In a sense, it actually helped tie Kanan into some of the older canon. Like, remember when, like, how Star Killer gave him, or sorry, Galen Merrick, because Star Killer is his clone. After yeah. that. Yeah, Galen Merrick sacrifices himself to help the rebels escape. So since mm-hmm. that was one of the big moments, I think, that helped Dave Filoni really make that moment really what it, everything that it could be. And he made something really beautiful 
out of that. Even the scene with Hera and Chopper, mm. you know, like he's he's always been this sassy robot that just doesn't care. But then they give even Chopper an emotional moment mm. uh, at following the death of Kanan and Hera mm. grieving. Mm. And it was so sad. It was like so, it hurt. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it did. Another emotional moment for him was back when season one, after Kanan was captured by the Inquisitor and Tarkin, and Chopper yeah. is there kind of mourning in his... And Ezra makes a plan mm. to, to rescue him. I mean, there's only two emotional moments for Chopper. Other than that, he's like the... Almost like a, almost like a, it was kind of being like Garfield. Like they say, Far yeah. Too is like the dog that everyone want, the wife wants to like. Chopper's the cat. Yeah, Chopper would be the cat. You know what's cool? They showed him in, in Rogue One. Yeah, that's right. They I mean, showed him in Rogue and One. They, and it's a General Syndulla. The black yeah. dude. Yeah. Everyone, everyone was so excited because it's like, oh my gosh, they're calling out for Hera. There was also another General Syndulla. Mm, that was right. Her, her father. Dad. <laughs> they do know it's Hera. Like, we're we pretty show, sure. We show, they, they show like in like I uh, forget what the title of it was. There was little like ten minute cartoon things. Maz uh -huh. She was the one who basically was like the MC for that. In different stories where they actually like, tied in like fifth characters from like Rogue One, like yeah. or the classic movies. Like there's one mission where on uh, Lothal or on uh, the New Planet from season two. Yeah. They basically where she meets with Jin Erso. Yeah. She, she runs into Jin? her. Okay. Yeah, she, and they actually team up for a little mission. Wow, that's yeah. cool. And there's also what, like, what was this? Is it, is it a book series or is it a video? It's, it's a video series. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, I'll check that out. What's it called? Uh, I, I forget the name. It escapes me at the moment, but I'll get to. Yeah, there's also a moment where she's actually they, where Hera is delivering supplies to Endor after Return of the Jedi, and yeah. they, she and Han Solo are having an argument about which one's the better ship, the Falcon or the Ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we're getting back to our conversation. We were talking about Thank heroes you. and villains. So heroes and villains. Okay, so who's my, your favorite villain? My favorite villain, I'd have to say. Well, I like the fact that Jim Cummings played. I don't know if you remember Jim Cummings from. He played like Darkwing Duck back in the nineties. He also, he? Yeah, he also played uh, the voice of Winnie the Pooh more recently. Oh, he, nice! And he also Jim Cummings. He also played. Uh, he's played a bunch of different roles over the years. But he, one of his he, he played uh, a character from Clone Wars and Rebels. Who was it? <laughs> Hondo. No way! I love Hondo. Yes, Hondo Onaka <laughs> is Jim Cummings. Dude, yes. Yes. Dude, I did not know Hondo was Winnie the freaking Pooh. <laughs> 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 you said favorite villain, favorite hero, but I think you were going to ask about favorite relationship. Yes, so that was something that uh, me and my wife have had many discussions about in this uh, in, in Star Wars Rebels and the universe that is there. What is your favorite relationship um, in Star Wars Rebels? Well, it's hard to say because I mean, especially among the Ghost crew, because there's so many different. Different ways that can go. Yeah, I was glad. To, I was glad in the end to see with season four. Spoiler alert again, if you haven't seen it. Again. That, that Kanan and Hera finally, in a sense, solidify or cement their relationship, where they actually finally kiss. Yes. And yes. <laughs> Dude, yes. my wife and I were like yelling. We were like, "Just kiss already!" And then like <laughs> she, she like kind of like backs off a little bit, and then he says something, and then she just jumps on him and kisses him. Mm -hmm. That was like this. The, one of the most satisfying mo like moments in the entire series because you've been waiting on it. You, they they made you wait for so dang long. Mm, it true, was true, but they did want to make it more of a family show, not so much like a, a right because like, they can't they can't put kissing in a show that's for kids, younger mm -hmm. audiences uh, in Disney, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of thing. And but then as the kids grow up and they want to see what some of the things happen, they're able to accept more things. That's when you can bring it in. Correct, and I think having them be that mom and dad figure on the ghost was also one of the reasons why they could justify it in the TV show for mm -hmm. kids. Because um, they did kind of play that mom and dad to Sabine, Zem, Chopper, and Ezra. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they, they, they were that family unit that kind of solidified them. What was your favorite episode and why? Hmm. Season one, two, three, and four, I'd say perhaps one of my favorite episodes would be actually Malachor. That's it. The Mal oh, Malachor, yes. Yes, Malachor. At the end of season two, seeing... Because Malachor in the Legends universe is a very pivotal place for the Jedi's Mandalorian Civil War. So basically, Malachor V was the place where it was... And that was like, they're actually, just like in Rebels, there's a, season, there's a Sith temple there called the Treus Academy. And Revan actually draws the Mandalorians there. It's a taboo world. And there, they are able to... He basically uses an artificial weapon called the Mass Shadow Generator. That's it. Mm. So it's basically it's an artificial gravity well that destroys a large part of the Republic fleet, but all the Mandalorian fleet... And, wow. and also, Revan uses the power of the Academy to corrupt his followers. Because mm -hmm. basically, he, he and Malak had come to a point where they basically had started to embrace the dark side. And basically, the, the, Mal the Mandalorians had taught them that, yes, you know, you gotta, the means must justify the end, or so, they, so they've been taught, they've come to think. Mm -hmm. And that's where Revan starts down the dark path, but doesn't end until after Malachor V, and he goes off in search of... Because before that, he'd also found evidence that the Sith Empire of 
Naga Seidao, from previous to like the time of Exar Kun, had survived. Yeah. And that's where we see it's meet the Sith Emperor, and he gets fully turned to the dark side. Mm-hmm. And that's when he and Malak come back as Sith. Yeah, and so Malakor is very pivotal in the Star Wars world, especially in the dark side in the Sith. And then they showing showing that having adventure on Malakor in Rebels. Mm. Um, how w- how was that then? Uh, yeah. How did that make you feel when you well, saw that? In it, was the Rebels? It, it was interesting. It's close to see it because remember, it says, it says Yoda had it was a sort of teaching moment for Yoda. Find Malakor. He yeah. showed Jeff tell him yes when do this when the ends justify the means this is what happens to you so this is the evidence of what occurs mm-hmm. plus seeing the fact that they tied in things from like the Force Awakens seeing yeah. the the T shaped the lightsabers that Kylo Ren will base his design off of yeah and also seeing Maul finally come back because after the there's a comic that comes after the Clone Wars where it was supposed to be part of season six of. Uh, that never really became season six of the Clone, of the Clone Wars. Wars. Yeah, basically to explain what happened to Maul after after he gets captured by Sidious and seeing his brother killed. Mm-hmm. Basically, what happens is that he Sidious uses him to get to Mother Tal's and she does finally die. Mm-hmm. And then we also see the death the Death Watch is the only thing that he has left. He gets his brothers from from Dathomir. He watches them die. The Shadow Collective gets split up, and really Maul's left with almost nothing. And then that leads to... Have you seen have you read the Ahsoka novel at all? No, but I've seen the book. Okay, yes. I've so, not read it. So, the red, so, spoiler alert. In the book, she actually was recruited during uh, the events of Episode 3. But just as, as Anakin and Obi-Wan are going to rescue Palpatine from Grievous, Ahsoka is recruited as so kind of an independent... Because like, she's no longer a Jedi, but she gets brought in as a volunteer. Yeah. And Rex and the 501st have fought alongside of her before, so she goes... And they're going to capture Maul on Mandalore. Mm. And basically he gets caught in the force field after a lightsaber duel with Ahsoka. Yeah. And then Order 66 kicks in. Uh, and she yeah. has to decide whether she's going to try and save Rex, who has removed his chip, so he's not under the control of the Order 66. So he, he and a few of the clones are resisting. And she has to decide, am I going to end things with Maul or am I going to save my friend? Mm-hmm. And so she ends up choosing to let Maul go and she saves Rex. And that's when she, both he and she fake their deaths and they go underground. So then later on they meet, of course, uh, through the, they can be in contact again through the rebels cause, through the rebellion. But basically that's why she's so surprised when she's on Malachor or that Maul survived. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that truly really seen like a true tie-in from the Clone Wars to with Rebels and seeing Maul who's just, he's like the Sith that almost can't die. Yeah. I mean, the, in the episode, he just doesn't go yeah, away. In the original canon he did die, but they, in the in like, middle like, you know, like even for legends, legends like like, like non canon comics that so they try and bring him back as a basically someone kind of preserves, preserves his brain and he appears as a hologram trying to attack Luke. Mm-hmm. Other times when he made it, they made this group called the Prophets of the Dark Side made a clone of Maul to try and confront Vader to show that maybe you're not as powerful as you think. Mm-hmm. That was an epic battle called it's in a comic called Resurrection of Evil. Yeah. Basically, where Vader, he's Vader's strength. Versus Maul's speed, and it's mm. amazing. Truly epic battle. Check it out if you have. That sounds cool. I haven't seen that yet. I don't want to. That sounds legit. Mm. Yeah, my and it, Maul versus Vader. Yeah, that's what every people... single fan of Star Wars ever has asked that question. Yes. and everyone's discussed it. Most people would side with Vader mm, some because side. he's mm-hmm. supposed to be. Yeah, the, the strongest. Yeah, he's I mean, supposed after, to be. Yeah, after all, Maul was more, was, was was a great apprentice, but he was a more of a tool. Yep. Like Tyrannus, that is Dooku, was more powerful than Maul as a mm-hmm. Jedi Master, but Duke, but Vader is supposed to be after all killing Dooku. He's supposed to be the most powerful apprentice of all. Right, in in both the Force and in his skill with the lightsaber. Mm. This new season, right? Mm-hmm. They get into some very interesting stuff with a certain portal. Mm-hmm. And uh, some some of the how the the legend the lore of the Force um, how it it binds the universe together. Mm. Okay, so there's some really cool stuff. I wanted to just uh, unleash you on this topic and, oh, and yes. see what okay. you had to say about the Mortis. Oh yes, the Mortis realm and the the fa- the, the Mortis family. Yes, yeah, that was really interesting to see these three individuals that seem to personify the Force's nature in very in and of itself. So actually, there's an interesting time from the Legends universe, too, but I'll get to that later. Mm. So my favorite, who, so who would you say is your favorite characters of the trio? The daughter, the son, or the father? The son, I think, looks the coolest, mm. but I think um, I think the daughter is actually the most intriguing to me. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. it's up in the air, because they're so mysterious oh, to me. Yes. It's oh. like, there's you know a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then it's like the rest of it's kind of imaginative. Ooh, yes, what I could think, happen? I'm trying to think. Oh yeah, was it? No, no. Sean Williams was the author, I think, or was he the actor? 
Sean Williams. Uh, I, I, I remember that the same guy who played. Let me the, see if I can find it. Yeah, so the same. The same other interesting tie-ins is that the son is actually that the same actor who played the son. That like his voice is also da, 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 the voice of Galen Merrick, aka Star Killer. Yeah. <laughs> Love Star Killer. Yeah, so yeah, his voice actor we came back to play to play the son. He or the father is one of my favorite characters because seeing how the son broke the rules of time and showed Anakin his future as Darth Vader, mm -hmm. that was awful. one of the most epic moments of the Mortis trilogy for me. Yeah, in the Clone Wars, that was like mm -hmm. that was some of the like the craziest storytelling I had seen for Star Wars, mm -hmm. and uh, it was so unique because they hadn't yet broken into that kind of thing in mm -hmm. the in the Star Wars uh, movies. And the, the Clone Wars was like the first of the TV. I mean, they had the 2D version of the Clone Wars. The 3D one was like the one that really grabbed me. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so yeah. through that, then I saw the 2D version too. There are actually some interesting tie-ins too with the some of the books on that. Grievous actually, when he faces off some of those Jedi, one of the couple, one of the, one or two of the Jedi he faces off with comes back. Remember the remember Crook? He was one of the, the green skin, the things there. Yeah, he actually doesn't die there, but he actually has to build a new lightsaber because Grievous took his his as a trophy. Okay, but yeah, it was like it was so so cool and informative, especially about Grievous. That was one of my favorite parts of that show. Yeah. Um, was Grievous mm. getting yeah. some depth there? Oh yes. Anyway, so getting back to the Mortis series, uh, yeah, that was pretty epic. I see it either the son or the father was my favorite character of that. Okay, you're yeah. saying someone who balances the light and the dark side. That's a very rare combination. Yeah, something we've only seen with like uh, maybe Bendu. Yeah, the Bendu, or <laughs> someone like maybe like Jin Altus, perhaps. Yes. The Altesian Jedi. Yeah, well, I mean, we've also seen uh, some people that operate in the light and the dark, like mm. Mace Windu. Or yeah. Revan, actually. Or Revan, mm -hmm. or even some some would argue that even Luke Skywalker does that himself. Mm. We've seen, you know, in, in uh, Return of the Jedi, you mm. see him force choking the Gamorrean guards, mm, and you see does... him threatening the life of Jabba the Hutt, you know, you see him come back in all black, which is something only Sith have done. Well, true. That he, but then remember, Luke was not raised in the formal Jedi Order, so he wouldn't know about the robes. Correct. He wouldn't know about the robes and as far as those traditions. However, he is utilizing some Sith practices, mm -hmm. and you see him having outbursts of, of anger and yeah, rage and yeah. almost striking, the, 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 striking down the Emperor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, he does come to the very edge of the Excuse dark me. side in that sense. But like, too, like Mike Mike Windu, he's riding the crest, but he chooses not to fall into the water, not mm -hmm. going, not going into the waves. Yeah, Vapad is something that is used by certain individuals. It is not always a good thing for Jedi to practice mm -hmm. because it is delving into both the the dark and the light and balancing that. Something that Snoke is you know known for discussing balancing mm -hmm. the light and the dark. You know, darkness mm -hmm. rises and light to meet it. And, um, yeah, there are actually a few. Like Mace Windu is the only one of the few who actually has used Vapad and not fallen to the dark side, which right. is why it's such a rare form anyway. Like his student in and Quinlan Voss. Yeah, well, Quinlan Voss he actually learned Vapad, but that was not from Mace Windu. In fact, no, yes, it was from the, um, the other guy, Sora Bulk. Yeah, he that was, was it. He was uh, Mace Windu's training partner, and says, "quote He didn't master Vapad. Vapad mastered him." This is from Mace Windu himself. Yes, correct. And ended up his his only student that came to mastery was Deepa Balaba in the new canon. That was Kanan's teacher. Yeah. But, but remember, she focuses mostly on close combat fighting on Form 3, Sarisu. Man, but yes, in, in Vapad, and she ends up getting like, drawn into it and drawn to the dark side through both her experiences and with the help of a very <clears throat> powerful and dark ally. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to spoil it. This goes back, yeah, to, go back to the Shatterpoint novel from the Clone Wars. Right. And so, keeping with um, the portal, you got to see that wall in Rebels. Well, well first, before, well, let, let me get into, like, the wolves. Mm. You know, like, the, having the Loth wolves on Lothal um, show up. They're this mystical creature. It's almost Bigfoot how rare they are. And they, you know, like, almost nobody can see them. But then there's legends that some have seen them, mm. not for maybe a hundred years. This goes back to... The time when the Jedi were around and people and Force users weren't being absolutely persecuted, they were typically being taken up, snatched up, and brought to the Jedi Temple. Mm -hmm. But um, Ezra being able to see these things and Kanan, you know, eventually having that that connection, becoming a lost wolf, a lost wolf. You know, he his Force spirit becomes that. And it, it, I love how they brought the whole story right back around to Lothal. It starts in Lothal, and it ends in Lothal. Mm. And, um, you know, they have adventures elsewhere, but it, it, it came back home. And then the amount of Force sensitivity that was happening there on Lothal, the tie-in with um, 
Yeah, uh, was it? Is it the Mortis Realm or is it just the portal? Well, I'd what, say, is, what is that? Is well, it, in a sense, I'd say the Mortis Realm. It has. It has to be that because in a sense, it's a time out of time. Like they yeah. go to they go to the old Jedi, the Jedi Beacon, and they find in the Clone Wars, and they find themselves in a different realm. And by the time when they have the trilogy ends, they've only been gone. Like Rex Re- says, "Hey, you guys, were gone for a second there." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the whole thing happened, and it's like, almost like a Narnia thing where they step out of the out of the world out of the real world into this mystical realm, mm-hmm. a mythical realm, or another dimension of time. And then when they get back to their own time, no time has passed. Right. And it's like it's kind of like they're traveling on the threads that bind the universe together, and that's mm-hmm. kind of the idea. There is that like just like Obi Wan said, you know, it it binds us, it penetrates us, mm-hmm. it it join it brings the whole universe together. It's in everything, mm-hmm. and then using that portal. Uh, it's a force portal mm-hmm. that takes them through the force, probably the force itself. That's probably what the force looks like from the inside out. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they travel on that on that path, and then you get to see him interact and find that moment with um, Ahsoka. Yeah, Ahsoka saving her from Vader, pulling her out into out of time, out yeah. of off Malachor into the Mortis realm, I call it. And yeah. Vader survives, and then that's how we see Ahsoka, when she goes back to Malachor... At the end of after talking with Ezra and escaping the Emperor, right? That's what that's how she sur- survives. And then we see her. I think she jumped back back to that time as Vader's walking away, and that's what shows her walking into the temple. Yeah, that's well, it shows her walking into the dark. Like you see her silhouette kind of fade into the black. Mm. They showed that in that actual fight at the end of that episode where she fights mm. Vader. And I saw that. I, apparently, my wife was she was watching with me, but she didn't see that. So when they did this reveal at the end with the time, she was like, "What? She's that's." What? Oh, that! And she was really surprised. I had thought we both saw that, so I, I guess it just didn't happen to well, come up in a conversation. Well, I was super excited though because I saw her walking away, but I was like, "Why does it look like she's limping? She didn't get struck." Mm. You know, she, like it, it, like it looked like she was limping, and then it explained exactly after being attacked by almost consumed by the Empress Fire, she was running. Yeah, to, to get away, and that made back. sense. Yeah, exactly. Actually, I like the fact that they brought Liam Neeson back in the Clone Wars as the Force yeah. Ghost. Yeah, and they, we actually get to see him. Totally. And you actually see him twice in there. He talks to Obi-Wan and then later on to Anakin. Mm-hmm. But then also he sees, he, so he talks about, what is this place unlike any other? A conduit through which the entire force of the universe flows. Which yes. is why I see like the portal later on in Rebels as part of that realm. Yeah. And perhaps it's like a different part of the Mortis realm we didn't get to see in the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. But yes, in truth, and seeing how actions in that, in, the, in that Mortis realm reflect on the real world, just or the, I should say, the physical plane. Yeah. Versus the ethereal realm where the Mortis beings live. Totally. And um, yeah, so I, I really loved the way that, that Rebels is, is wrapping up. I'm not going to touch on the very last. Mm-hmm moments of the of the show but it's so it's so good i i had such a blast watching where they took where dave filoni took the story how meant how much was thought out so far in advance and how he was able to wrap some of those details from the first episode from the you know the first you know the se- first episode of the second mm-hmm. season and some moments into those like flashback sequences and then also the uh I'm, what we're going to call the mortis realm we're going to assume is the mortis realm and the Force, yeah. tying the universe together, how they foreshadowed that in, in the Clone Wars and in some in all the legends, you know, you can see those things here and there kind of sprinkled throughout. The idea that the Force mm-hmm. binds everything together, you get an in-depth look in how that mm-hmm. can play out. Yeah, the only reason I thought, thought it was the, called the Mortis Realms is because remember we see the Convor, the little bird thing, that like little green bird that it's attached, right. attached to so- Ahsoka after the daughter dies because that yeah. was the daughter's creature. And, and then we see it, the first time we see it in that portal realm is but after in after Ezra has gone through and he's like, Well wait a minute, I remember seeing you. Yeah. You always remember when Ahsoka was. Man, this has been such a cool session. Mm. I love Star Wars Rebels and I hope that they continue, you know, there there's gonna be plenty of more opportunity to have you back on the show. We're gonna probably talk more about uh, the end of Rebels, probably get into maybe some of the Clone Wars. And then also, you know, we can talk about that upcoming Star Wars T V show. Mm. Another that one. is a live action TV Ooh. show. There's a great director confirmed tied for the project. There is also it's probably going to happen after the Lion, the live action Lion King because uh, he's directing that one as well. CGI, booyah! It's going to be cool. Seeing Rafiki and Mufasa and Scar in yeah. live and CGI, all oh. it's going to be. I so just, cool. I just hope they can they still do the spirit of things. A lot of the Disney remakes from recently, I think they've had not really had the magic that the old original versions had. Right, and it's I don't think anything will ever stack up to. Whatever that was that set your nostalgia bar, you know, like if you if you if you love The Lion King, the live action is probably not going to be the best thing in the world. But 
if they if they stay close, mm. then most of us, the fans of the original Lion King, are probably going to have a kick out of seeing it brought to live action mm. anyway. Regardless of if you wanted something to happen or something else to happen, wanted it to be the same, wanted it to be a little different, you know, whatever it is, there's always going to be the critiques mm. in comparison to what it was that we loved. Yeah, just like we did with the Star Wars Legends versus the Disney canon. There's always going to be people who are a little nitpicky details, but as long as they stay true to the original spirit of it all, it should be okay. Yeah, it should be. And so, and then, you know, it's up to you to determine how you feel about it. And let us know in the comments what you thought about our discussion here. Did you learn something new? Uh, is it, you know, was there something that you disagreed about? Is there something that you liked about Rebels? that we didn't mention yeah, is there something, something that you didn't like something anything you'd like us to discuss for next time totally we'd love to take that down in the comments and we will hear that we will make another discussion because mm -hmm. any chance we get to hang out and talk about star wars is a blast 110 percent. 110 percent. really quick to tie it back in you have a youtube channel daniel gall he does vocal impressions insanely good vocal impressions of a lot of really cool characters you love Lots of Star Wars characters, Lord of the Rings characters. You do a lot of animated characters from cartoons. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to uh, give us some of your Star Wars? Oh. Which would you like to hear, Master Loera? Misa Jar Jar Binks. Ah, the cats. What the hell was thinking? There we go. <laughs> Goodness. Han Solo. It is I, St. Repio. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that was one of the best whistles. I can't even whistle. Da na na tota. Oh, you do Java? Yeah. I don't know you do Java. I'm a Toytarian. My tanks don't work on me. Only money. <laughs> this is such a blast. Such a, a blessing to have you, bro. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you for having me. Over. Thank you so much. Check him out at Daniel Gall. G A U L. That's mm -hmm. like Darth Maul, but Daniel Gall. So check him out. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Guys, make sure to like this video if you liked it. Share it with those you love. And again, subscribe so you can make sure to get all of my content as soon as it comes up. Make sure to hit that notification button as well so you can be notified on your phone or mobile device whenever that happens so you don't miss a thing. And remember, the Force will be with you always. Always. And again, always on The Stuff of Legend.